Well, welcome. <clears throat> My name's uh, Keith Parsons, and today we'll be talking about some things I've learned in the last uh, two decades. It's been 20 years I've been playing in Wi-Fi. Sounds like a long time. Feels like a long time. Look at got gray hair because of this thing. Um, so, out to seven, uh, we added a couple in here just to to see if we could could round it out and get uh, a little more information transferred while we're there. But in order to get started, let's uh, get going and hit the the first little presenter slide. Yeah, I'm up to 87 certifications, but that's uh, actually hopefully by the end of the year I'll have 90. Uh, I try to get about 10 a year or so if I can uh, schedule those in. That's also, I mean, it's not just a disease that I like to collect certifications. It's how you stay ahead in the game. Uh, I've been doing this for a couple decades now and just Wi-Fi specific. Uh, my contact information is on the screen. If you want to contact me either via Twitter or email, glad to talk with you. So first one, and this is number zero. It doesn't actually count. We're not, uh, this isn't one of the seven, but I think it's very important. And I don't know if you've ever heard the analogy before about the big rocks. So the picture on the screen, you can see there's two jars and they have the same amount of rocks and sand and small rocks and big rocks. And if you assign someone the task of filling the jar with all these items, it really matters which order you put them in. If you put the sand in first, it fills up the bottom. And then you put the small rocks in, it fills up this there. And then you add the big rocks and eventually they don't fit. But if you just do things in reverse, you put the big rocks in first and then the small rocks and shake a little bit and then the sand and shake it a little bit, you can get all of it to fit at the same time. The jar represents the time we have available to us. If you put the things that matter most in your life first, you get them done. So for me, putting family first was most important. I took my calendar and the first thing I did was add when the children have uh, football games or uh, dance recitals or the things that I needed to be present for my family and they went on the calendar first. And then it was very easy if someone else wanted to schedule time, I could easily just say, sorry, I, I have something already scheduled on that time slot. You didn't have to tell them that it was a dance recital. But what happened was is it allowed me to accomplish a lot of things in business, travel around the world, do lots of work, and still meet the goals that I had set for myself with my wife that family came first. <clears throat> so just remember the big rocks, big rocks go in first. Now, I'm not a beer drinker, but I've heard that uh, after you fill the big rocks and the small rocks and the sand, there's still time for a beer because you can pour beer in there and I'll fill it up as well. So first rule up, just take care of your family. Family is important. Um, and later we're going to talk about some family issues as well. But just realize you can, if you choose properly, put the first things first. So right at the top. Certifications. Now, I'm a strong believer in certifications for a lot of different reasons. Not just the knowledge you gain, but mostly it's the knowledge you gain. There's some discipline that takes place because you have to study and think about things. Um, first up, right in the center, is CWMP. Vendor neutral certifications on how the technology itself works. I'm a strong believer, totally behind the CWMP program from CWNA, SBDP, AP. I've taught all these different courses. Uh, I think they're a good way for you to build up your, your ability inside to know the technology flat out. You just have to know what's going on. In addition to the CWMPs, and this is why I continue to get more and more certs all the time, there are certifications from individual vendors that you might want to focus on as well. So yes, getting a CWNE is fantastic, love it, hurrah, more people start in that path. But for each of the vendors, there's an entire different certification path to go through from the basics to the more complex to being known as an expert in that specific vendor. Now I just showed a couple up here, but all of the vendors have certification programs as well. So certification needs both the generic non-vendor specific neutral kind of things 
and then the specifics for whichever vendor you're supporting. And later, we're gonna talk a little bit about supporting people as well. But just because you have a cert, doesn't mean you actually know how to do it. You just got the, the thinking knowledge. Thinking knowledge is fantastic. Yes, we need it. But in addition, you need to lab. Lab, lab some more, and go back and lab again. Just yesterday, I was labbing up some new gear because, yeah, you've got to learn it and test it and play with it and put it up. So I think you should have a lab at home, uh, especially in this COVID time when you're spending more time at home. But have a lab, your own gear. Uh, people ask me all the time, what should I get? Well, you know, you can learn the CWMP concepts on anything. Well, anything you can have control over. So you might want to not want to go with the home user stuff because they usually block the interface from allowing you to get into the nitty gritty details. They're made for home users. So Linksys, D-Link, Netgear, all the ones you'd buy at the electronic store, they're good, you can practice with them, but they're made for a home user not to really mess around with and get to the details. I'd recommend if you wanna start on the low end with something more like a Microtik or Ubiquity, where you have all like full granular control over everything to play with. Just a caveat, and we'll talk about this in a minute as well, choosing the vendor you support and that you understand will have a huge impact on your income stream well into the future. So, so though you might play with it in a lab, what you really need is a lab with the gear you're going to use in the way you're going to make your living. If you're gonna be supporting Cisco, then have a Cisco gear lab. Now you don't have to go out and buy brand new stuff. The main concepts haven't changed in, actually in 20 years. We still have co-channel interference. We still have adjacent channel interference. We still have beacon rates and the basis of 802.11 hasn't changed. So if you have 20 year old gear that people get rid of on eBay, better yet, 10 year old gear that people get rid of on eBay, uh, right now I've seen a bunch of people doing upgrades from Cisco 3700s, great access point, get a little baby controller and between those two you can run just about everything you need to lab up. Now it's not gonna be current with the current gear, but the main concepts haven't changed. So lab, 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 lab. If I, when, I, when I teach this and we have a whole audience and you're all sitting in front of me, I'd be like, raise your hands if you have a home lab. <clears throat> I've yet to meet a CWE that didn't have a home lab. Well, definitely didn't meet a CCIE who didn't have a home lab. People who are successful have labs. If you'd like to be successful, have a lab. Have I reiterated this enough times that you really need to set up a lab so you can practice what you're talking about? Now, on to that question that I, the, the topic that I alluded to. Choose your vendor wisely. This isn't a lightweight question. This is, this is like career altering, change the trajectory of your entire life for the next 10, 20 years. Sadly, and, and this is truly, I'm truly sad about this, but it doesn't matter if I'm sad or upset or that I don't believe, I don't want to believe it. It's true. If you support and are behind and know how to use and sell and so train and install and do all of the things that we do as wireless land professionals, if you do it on Cisco, you get paid more money. It's that simple. Now, I think, and this is just me pontificating and thinking about all sorts of things. I think it's because if a customer pays a thousand euro for a high-end access point, they're more willing to pay the installer a percentage of that for doing the install. Let's say it's 10%. So installing an AP, you could earn a hundred euro. What if you are installing a 50 euro Microtech? What are they willing to pay? Well, they might pay a higher ratio, but they're not gonna pay you more to install something than it costs. So your income potential is tied directly to the vendor you choose to support. Now, I, I make it sound like it's your choice. 
it is your choice. Now, it might be easier to go into a caravan park and sell the caravan park owner ubiquity gear because it costs a lot less money. But your income as a percentage of that will be lower than if you could sell them Cisco. Sorry, that's just the way it is. So choosing your vendor, you might want to look and say, hey, we've got Cisco, Aruba, Ruckus, one, two, three in the industry. Pick one of those. Uh, Extreme's pretty big. They picked up uh, Arrowhive. Juniper has missed. Um, if you pick up one and that's the one you're going to support, fantastic. Now, you should be able to be ambidextrous and support more than one of these, but at a minimum, you need to be really good at at least one network. The ones on the right all have some issue around them. Not Huawei's big and yet they usually sell fairly inexpensive. And if you support Huawei, you probably have a lot of work to do. So nothing wrong with that. Just think through the ramifications of which vendors you support. I chose a vendor once and got behind it and realized that was probably not the best choice. Uh, the people I dealt with just talking about numbers, they would be shocked when they would hear a number and they're like, we can't pay that because the hardware only cost X. I can't pay you more than a portion of X. That's the way the business goes. So we're talking about tips on things I wish I learned. I wish I had learned this earlier and focused stronger on some of the larger companies because it helps my own income. So I'm recommending to help your income as well. Not that you can't make a living supporting any of the others. It's just that's what I've seen how it works in the industry. One of the things I uh, learned when I went to university, and I happened to go to a university that had a business school program, and I got my undergraduate in uh, finance. But I happened to have a job working in the dean's office in the School of Business. And the School of Business covered finance, marketing, accounting, uh, MBA programs, master's in accounting programs, public administration, all of those things. But I, I reported directly to the dean. I was kind of his liaison helping him with computers. And as I neared graduation, he came to me and said, uh, I'd like you to fill out this card. And he gave me a little three by five card. And I have three by five cards with me all the time. Just a little card. I write notes on them. I think as an adult, you need to have something to write on and something to write with all the time. I use them daily. And he gives me this card and he says, Kate, you've been in school, what, four years now? You're about to graduate. I would like you to fill out on this card and you can use both sides. The most important things you learned in the last four years. And I looked at the card and I looked at him and I went, what? Four years of education. I'm here doing this whole thing and it comes down to, you want me to fill out a little card? And then I took it seriously. Partly because he said, you can use your paid hours that I'm paying you for to work on it. So I didn't have to go home and do something else. I just sat at my desk. And instead of working that day, I spent four hours working on a little card, thinking back through all the things I had learned. And in the end, one of them is what I'm putting on the screen here. First, risk and return are inseparably connected. Now, after it's been 30, 40 years since I've been in university, the I've added to that one. Instead of risk and return are inseparably connected, I had to add as long as you're doing things that are moral. Because there's ways you can break that if you want to break the law and do other things. But you are worth exactly what it costs to replace you. I didn't, I didn't necessarily have to go to university to learn that. And here we're talking, and you don't have to go to university, you don't have to go anywhere else. Just realize that your value to whichever company you're working for. I've been independent for the past 20 plus years, running my own company. But it doesn't matter. My customers will pay me what I save them for not paying someone else. If you're an employee and they can pay you what it's going to cost to pay someone else to do the exact same job. So what I'm trying to get here is make yourself more valuable by being hard to replace. Now, I don't mean being stupid. I've met people who are like, I'm going to be the holder of the knowledge 
and I know how to fix this one machine on this one widget, and no one else does. So I'm irre I'm irreplaceable because I'm irreplaceable. I'm worth more, so you have to pay me more. And usually, what happens? The company figures out a way to document what you're doing and replace you with someone else. What I mean here is make your skill set, the things you can do, be worth more to the company. If you're a great technician, learn documentation skills. Learn how to write. And by the way, everyone who's looking at me right now, you need to write. If you say, I don't know how to write, then start learning. Practice. It's nothing. You didn't know how to walk when you were little. You didn't know how to ride a bike. You can learn to write. Writing is a huge skill to be able to communicate. I haven't seen, a, probably in the last 15 years, any job application that didn't say something on the line about the ability to communicate well. Companies like you that you can communicate well. So learn your skills, technically. Learn the soft skills. Be able to get along with people. Be able to write down cogent sentences. So part of that is, I say, start to blog. The more you blog, the better your skills in writing will be, the better your skills in technical will be. You have a technical question, research it. Write up the, a, a blog article about what you did. Now, there are lots of blogs in our industry. Anyone can start a blog. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. If you just want to write a guest blog and not deal with the blog infrastructure, anyone who has a blog will gladly take your guest blog. Just write. So your value is what it costs to replace you. Now, part of that is also your skills. If you can support a Cisco box, you will get paid more than the people who can support a MicroTik box. Not that it's more skillful, it's just that the customers pay more for Cisco gear, so as a ratio, you get more. Some of the other things to look at, people pay more for those individuals who travel. So in our um, wireless and professionals, every uh, year we run out a survey to find out what people are making from a compensation standpoint. And for every night that you don't sleep in your own bed, you sleep at a hotel, so there's a travel or night. For every night during a month that you sleep away from your bed, on balance, people earn 4% more income on an annual basis. So if you're five nights away, that would be one quarter time travel. So out of one week a month of travel, earns about 20% higher income than people who don't travel at all. That doesn't mean you just can't go and sleep in a hotel and get paid more. It's not causation, it's correlation. People who do that kind of work get paid more. So if you wanna get paid more, do that kind of work. And this is where it comes back to the whole family thing. Well, I, I have family, I have little kids. I, I, I don't wanna be away from at night. Fine, stay home. Just realize that if you did that, you would get paid more. That doesn't mean that you're a bad person because you're a good father, you can't be a good provider. Just realize that those things are linked find something else to be good at that doesn't require those extra little features. So, number three, you're worth what it costs to replace you, be valuable. Four, now I could spend the entire presentation on know the rules and then you can break them. In fact, a couple of years ago, I gave a presentation here on a whole list of, I think we probably covered 40 rules for best practices in Wi-Fi but it's okay to break every one of them. Every time I post something strident, ardent, strongly on Twitter, always, never, those kind of strong words, like never put an AP in a hallway. People come back and say, whoa, but there's times when you, if, you, if and if and if, and I'm like, fantastic, great, yes. If you understand the why I said the rule, never put an AP in a hallway, and you have a reason to break that rule, fantastic. If you don't know why there's the rule there, follow the rule. It's okay to break the rules, but only when you know why. I see a lot of people on crazy forums who plot, put APs on a wall like a clock. Why? Because there's a little keyhole on the side and they think that's how you're supposed to mount it. And then they see someone else who's mounted them on the wall like a clock and then they do the same thing and because Wi-Fi is so extremely resilient, it just works, they continue to break the rule. 
They didn't know what the rule was though, and they didn't know why they're breaking it. And so what happens is you're taking a antenna pattern and you're rotating it. Yeah, Wi-Fi is still gonna work, but you lose 6 dB of SNR by rotating the AP into a field it wasn't supposed to be in. Are there times I put APs on the wall like a clock? Of course. Are there times I put APs in hallways? Yes. Every one of the rules that we have for best practice has a, has a reason why you can break them. So learn the rules first before you break them. I, you, I, I did some really stupid things. I've installed some really, really dumb things in my day. I used to put amplifiers, 30 dB amplifiers on between the AP and the antenna. Why? Because I could. They were $600 and I thought it was pretty cool because I could boost that signal up and I could get more bars than anyone in the building. Funny thing happened though, the Wi-Fi didn't work really well. It's not about being green. It's about making the clients actually do what they need to do. So just increasing SNR, and in that case, I increased S, which made an N stayed the same, so it looked really good. I didn't understand that it was only one way. The client couldn't get back. Just because the client could hear the AP didn't mean the AP could hear the client. So learn the basics and the rules first. If you understand the rules, then everything else is going to flow a little easier. So again, nothing wrong with breaking the rules. Just have a reason why. Tied into that, here's a slide. In fact, I used this very slide with this same group for Wi-Fi Design Day in Birmingham last year. It's part of something I built for a troubleshooting class. But we can look at it now and say, wait, this is how Wi-Fi works. The red stuff is how Wi-Fi works in the air. The blue is how those same frames as they get turned into Ethernet frames go across the LAN, and the green is how they get transferred over the WAN. Inside the red box where it says RF medium, for every single frame, there's a process that happens. There's 802.11 overhead. There's a DFS process that's looping around. There's an MCS process for every single transmission. It's going to choose modulation, coding, guard interval, channel width, and it's gonna make that decision frame by frame by frame. Every single device is gonna be doing this. On the bottom half is showing the association process and how that goes from association to authentication to encryption. Then we get to upper layers and finally it makes its way to the AP. Understanding this entire flow is what I was talking about, know the rules. Understand how your Wi-Fi works. And then you can make a judgment call and say, oh, I understand that the MCS is going to be doing this. So if I do Y, how is it going to affect what's going to happen? I'll break that one rule. I understand how clients associate. If I go through and add in a captive portal, where is that going to change things? I like putting in open SSIDs when I'm doing my initial design. So I can prove the RF, the red part works perfectly. And then I turn on the captive portal and something breaks. Well, I know it's not the Wi-Fi that broke because it worked without uh, a encryption. The RF worked, now I turned on encryption and now my .1x has a problem. So I like having an open SSID just for that. Now, customers are like, turn off the open, sure. But I like leaving it there so when I need to do a test, I can come back and just turn on the open, make sure, oh, RF is working, it's not an RF issue, we now know it's when I turn on encryption, it's now it fails, and so I can tell why. So understanding the basics will help you know when and where to break those best practice rules. Like this little picture. The blue ball is the association process. It's 802.11. Probe request, probe response, then occasion request, then occasion response, association request, association response. Now I'm associated, associated is to wireless with a link light is to wire. If on the wired side and you've got a link light, you troubleshoot up the stack, not down, because you know you have a link light. In Wi-Fi, if we're associated, I don't need to troubleshoot down the stack because Wi-Fi is working. How do I know Wi-Fi is working? Because if I get a PSK request, that means that I attempted, and then the access point is saying, hey, what's your PSK? So I got past part of it. If I have an IP address, I get over here to upper layers and I get a DHCP IP address. 
well, I know that it's not the piece before it or the piece before that because it's all there. On this slide, if we get over to Captive Portal, by the time I get to Captive Portal, that means I associated, I authenticated, I encrypted, I passed port control, I got my upper layers, I got my VLAN, SM, and DHCP, DNS. I had access on the local area network. It transferred the information. I even did a HTTP request, and then the Captive Portal kicked in. Now I can say, oh, what part works, what part doesn't work? Understand the basics, understand the fundamentals. That's what I mean by know the rules and then you can break them. This one took me probably 10, 15 years to learn. The little kind of joke thing that's on the left, good, fast, cheap, choose two. Now, a friend of mine, Ben Miller, thinks you can choose all three. That's his claim, it's one of his claims. He likes to say, you should be able to do all three. I haven't found a lot of places where that holds true. Customers need to understand that if you want highest quality, you're going to pay for it. If you want it fast and low quality, but you need it really, really fast, you're still going to pay for it. If you want it slow and low quality, then you don't have to pay very much. There, it, you choose, let the customer choose. This is a negotiation, but realize you, you have to add something or take something away. Part of our WN design process is we meet with customers and we talk about what they want. What I'm suggesting is don't be a wimp. Sometimes I've been with salespeople who go in on one of these sales calls and they're meeting with the customers and have their little checklist and they ask the customer, where do you want coverage? And the customer says, everywhere, everywhere. For what devices? All devices. You want me to go fast? All fast, super fast. And they, and they don't ask the hard questions like, you know, every one of those checks costs money. Do you want to pay for coverage everywhere? Do you want to pay for all devices? Or is there a special device that you need covered and the other devices you can maybe not? Our customers will continue to ask for everything, all the time, everywhere, until we let them understand that each of those decisions has a cost. So that's part of it. The second part of this is it's okay to get rid of a customer. Now I've been independent for a long time, and it took me a while to realize that it is totally fine to cut off a customer. Now, if you're an employee and your boss says, go work with customer XYZ, you're gonna go work for customer XYZ. But your company might wanna look at and find there, and this is what I found, I have 20 years of running my own business. There are customers who make you money. There are customers who cost you money. Just because they pay you does not mean that you're gonna have a profitable situation with every customer. Pareto's rules, 80-20s, however you wanna put it, 80% of your income comes from 20% of your customers or the reverse, however you wanna deal with it, you will have customers who end up costing you money. So it's okay to say, bye. And they're gonna be like, but, but I, I, I want to work with you and I might not want to work with you for whatever reason. I've seen lots of situations where people should have got rid of a customer, a situation, a contract sooner, and it would have made it better for everyone. So just realize number five, it's okay. You don't have to be everything to everyone. This is that looking at you there. 20 years in the industry, there's a lot of people I know. I've personally taught nearly 10,000 individuals. I hope that I've left them all with a, at least a positive thought that, oh yeah, I could call him. And I get emails, texts, Twitter messages all the time from people saying, yeah, I took a class from you 10 years ago. Uh, I have a question for you. And I would like people to feel like they can, they can do that and ask me those questions. Part of that is building a relationship with the people around you. In the UK, you have this event. Now, I know it's not live, and it would be nice if you were all together and you could stand around those little tall tables and talk and, and have your snacks together. But you can get together other ways. There's a UK Slack channel. There's a podcast that you can get in on. You could start your own blog, your own podcast. Get together with others who are in your industry and get together. Just don't be a jerk. There are people who just 
can't get along with others. They make it hard for their own careers moving forward because they leave a wake, like a boat driving has a wake behind it. Try to lead a wakeless life. Um, now, some would say if you lead a wakeless life, you haven't built any relationships. So it's a, a dual-edged sword. You, you need to be out there and to make statements and to interact with people. And maybe some don't like your style. And so, yeah, you might be that way. But in the in the grand screen, just don't be a jerk. There's there's a lot of nice things you can do. Just be nice. Think the golden rule. All those nice, easy things actually hold true. After 20 years in the industry, it's easy to find people that you can be friends with and go out and have a drink with and or dinner and just talk. It's okay. It's okay to be friends. It's not okay to be a jerk. Number seven. Now I put this in the term, it's a medical term. My my wife's a nurse, my two of my daughters and a son are nurses. My other son's a, a, a CEO of a hospital. They, they follow their mother and they do medical stuff all the time. So in my world, we talk medical things around the dinner table. Triage is a technique to solve problems quickly when they're very, uh, lives could be at stake. So triage happened the, the first time was around uh, World War I. Uh, at the end of the Crimea War was Florence Nightingale, and she was a nurse and had that. And then, you know, a decade or so later, when they had the uh, First World War, they found that they were having higher death rates for wounded soldiers than they had seen before and tried to figure out why. So the medical establishment went to the front lines, watched how they brought the wounded soldiers in, and how the surgeons took care of them. And what they found was, a little disturbing, actually, that the officer corps, not officers are, are not, there's not a lot of them. And back then, especially in World War I, they were more from the aristocracy. And a doctor was also from that same class and would find a friend, another officer, and they would take care of them first because they had familiar relationships. And what the medical establishment saw was sometimes they would pick the wrong patient to take care of. Part of that was because of that relationships they had had, but it was causing other people to die. So what they did is they took the crusty old nurses who had been around in the Crimea War and put them at the front line at that triage point that when the wounded soldier came in, this nurse looked at him and said, you, yes, you're an officer. Thank you very much. Here, have some tea. You've been gut shot. You're going to die. This was pre-antibiotics and they had a very low chance of surviving and find the enlisted person and take him to the surgeon because we could save more lives. So in World War I, they figured out triage saves lives. Every hospital, every emergency system, every ambulance in the world uses triage. So what I'm suggesting is we're gonna look at and use the same technique, triage, finding out what's bad first, fast, to solve problems in Wi-Fi. So you go to a doctor's office today, you walk in and they weigh you. Like, why are you weighing me? I have not, it has nothing to do with why I'm here. They take your blood pressure, they take your temperature, and you haven't even seen the doctor yet. Now what they're doing is they're saying, we've found some telltale signs from hundreds of thousands and millions of doctor's visits that in the end, if your temperature is higher, the doctor needs to know about that because it's gonna trigger other things. If you've lost weight in the last three months or gained weight, that might have something to do with some of the diseases you could have. <clears throat> your blood pressure is high, your blood pressure is low, your pulse is fast. All of those things have to do with the doctor's diagnosis. So what are we gonna use in Wi-Fi that we can do that same kind of doctor visit triage? Now I've got it down to just three. Now I'm gonna put them in reverse order and I'll spend a little time on the last one. But for me, it's the blood pressure is channel utilization. You can go on site, check channel utilization, and it will tell you so fast how healthy is the RF. That's really what we're there for. That previous picture that had the red, blue, and green, it's the red that we're, we're trying to triage the red, the wireless part. And Channel utilization is something you can look at right away and find out how healthy that specific area is 
on that channel. Now a pulse is retry rates. If I have retry rates, retry rates are telling me something's wrong. Some There was an attempt, it failed, we had to send a retry. Now if the retry rates are five, six, seven percent, I don't lose any sleep, I don't even try to fix it. But if the retry rate is up above 10, 12, 15, 20 percent, I have a problem and that retry rate is the little telltale marker telling me, yeah, something's going wrong. Now, additionally, retry rates have some extra information that we don't think about all the time. A transmitter attempted to send something, it failed, so it sent a retry. Now, the retry is a single bit, so I don't know how many times it retried. All I know is that there was a retry. So that's why I need to look at the retry rate, not just that there was a retry, but what what's the percentage? Now, what happens when we have a retry, depending on its number, how many happen, and the algorithms obviously in the firmware, we're going to have a potential that a data rate is gonna to shift. Too many retry rates, it's gonna to try to shift and download, down, down shift the data rate. So another telltale sign that comes with retry rates is a change in data rates. Now I've found, for me, the best and the number one thing I use is MCS rates. It's like a temperature. If you have broken the leg, why are they taking your temperature? Because if your leg broke and you got an infection, your temperature is gonna rise. There's a lot of things doctors do with a temperature to say, oh, something else that I can't see right now is causing that. MCS is that to me. I wanna know what is the next MCS rate that I'm gonna transmit out. On Mac OS, I use Adrian Granados's fantastic tool, Wi-Fi Signal, and I plot it on my screen. It's up on the top of my screen all the time, telling me what's my current MCS, and it changes. I can be sitting here right now. Oh, well, right now my MCS is nine because I've got a very good position, and it's working well. But if MCS changes, there was a situation where the transmitter, now this isn't the AP only or client only, but one of the two, because they both have to transmit, every time they transmit, they're gonna make a decision about how they should move. Here, let's, let's just look at it. On the MCS table, if an AP can do 80 megahertz wide channels, three spatial streams, client can do 80 megahertz channels, three spatial streams. In their association process, they negotiate, they share that information, and they get over here, where it's 1.3 gig. That's what they could do. Now, everything above it and to the left are possibilities. So the transmitter device, could be the AP, could be the client, is gonna to attempt to send a signal, a radio wave, modulated in a certain format, and send it to the receiver. Now, in the beginning, it might say, oh, I can do 1.3 gig, 1,300 megabits, so can the receiver. So let me package up the frame, and I'm gonna package up with 256 QAM. I'm gonna use a 256 QAM modulation scheme. I'm gonna use a 506 coding scheme. This is forward error correction, and I set that. I'm gonna use an 80 megahertz wide channel with short guard interval, package the frame with that format, send it over the air. The receiver is going to receive that, demodulate it, figure out what it says, calculate the MCS to make sure it's all good, and if it's good, it's gonna send an ACK. So if I send a frame modulated in MCS 9, spatial streams 3, channel width 80, I'm gonna deliver exactly like that. And if I get an ACK back, I'm happy. But what if I don't get an ACK back? Something else was wrong. Was it the modulation that caused the failure? Was it the coding scheme that caused the failure? Was it the channel width that caused the failure? Because you know every time you go from a 20 to a 40, you lose 3 dB SNR, because the signal stays the same, but the noise floor climbs. When I'm over 80, that's 6 dB lower than a 20. Was that the reason it failed? And the transmitter is making all these decisions on the fly, frame by frame by frame. So what I want to look at and to tell the health of any Wi-Fi at any time, is I just find out what's the MCS index that someone sent. If it's a, now, 
I was just running through this yesterday. I'd set up a test and I could only maintain one spatial stream. My client device could do 1300. The AP could do more than 1300, but I was only staying within spatial stream one because of the physical environment I was in. So if you're staying at MCS eight and nine, you have really good RF. Now, I, I might not have this fastest speed because I don't have a spatial stream, but that's caused by the environment, not my device and not the, the loaded RF. Now, being able to hit 256 QAM, you gotta be pretty close. You gotta have really high SNR to pull that off. How high? Well, over here in a, uh, I need 29, maybe 30 SNR and a 20 megahertz channel. In an 80 megahertz channel, I need up here to 35 to 37 SNR. So it's gotta be really good RF. Now, if I'm down getting a five, six, or seven, and I really don't care. If I get eight or nine, yeah, it's great. But if I get a five, six, seven, it's good. And I don't really have an RF problem because I'm maintaining 64 QAM. 64 QAM is, I mean, if we want to get into a whole hassle there, we can show how it's calculated, but it's very decent, well-designed, high-end, lots of little, 64 actually, little targets that we're doing, and we're hitting them consistently. If we're just moving five, six, seven, moving back and forth, it's attempting to change the coding scheme to tune it a little bit better, but we're staying in 64 quant. So if I have a five MCS or better, I don't have an RF problem. Because if I did have an RF problem, it would instantly show up that I would slow down to one of the lower ones. If I'm down at one or two, if I'm not at zero, I've got BPSK. That's that's horrendously bad Wi-Fi. That means I'm having a really, really hard time in the RF. But you know what? I can still push six meg. Netflix only needs four for HD. So even the worst possible Wi-Fi can still deliver Netflix at HD quality. So we need to understand the basics. We need to understand how this works. We need to look at the triage parts, channel utilization, retry rates my favorite MCS rates, and know where we sit. The reason I put this on here is you should have MCS table. Now, there are people who have memorized this. I don't, I just take one with me. I have it all the time. It's on my phone, so I can just flip to a, a just a photo that I've saved to go and figure it out where I'm at, because it makes that much difference. So understand how to triage, pick your your poison, whether it be data rates, retry rates, channel utilization or MCS and know how to triage and find out is it an RF issue first and then you can choose it a lot faster. The last one, this is number eight, I'm just gonna add it in as a bonus. The quote on here is from Teddy Roosevelt, but the, but the big, you can, you can read it obviously on your own. It's be in the arena. We're here, we have a community, you're part of the community in the UK, Engage. Now, we're not at a live event, but if you're at a live event, just don't stand there. Talk to the people around you. Since this is a virtual event, I'm going to give you some virtual tips. Here's how you engage. Here's a list. Screenshot this if you want. Uh, you can get all the slides from Sam afterward. I should send them to him. But find a person either on Twitter, on Slack, on DM, on LinkedIn, a blog post, Come, uh, come in on their email somehow, find someone you'd like to talk to and engage with and ask them a sincere technical question. Now, don't ask really, really stupid questions that you could have figured out on your own. So if you're gonna ask someone to mentor you, to help you along, to cause this, and you ask a question that's, that should have been able to answer if you just read a book, go read the book. But if you didn't understand after reading the book, maybe send the message. I know both David Coleman and David Westcott who wrote the CBNA book, they'll be glad to engage with you. They, they follow this all the time. So ask a question, find someone on Twitter, ask them a question. Hopefully it's a legitimate question you really don't understand and you'd like to know. And then research it yourself. Now you're gonna ask someone outbound. And I have this technical question. They might give you an answer doesn't really matter. If they do or if they don't, great. If they do, take their answer. But I still say, go research on your own. Do the effort to work through and figure out what it is. 
They give you an answer, maybe they don't believe them. So try it again. And then blog about what you've done. Every time you go learn something, don't waste all of that learning. You take notes in school, take notes here in your after school life about what you learned. Write a blog about it. And then post the blog and share with the community. You don't have to have your own blog. There are guest blogs. You can guess, uh, I'll let you guest blog on my blog, or I know lots of people let you guest blog if you don't want your own. And then take that same message back to the original person you said, I asked you this question. Here's what I did. I took your answer. I did this research. I wrote up this little paper. What do you think about it? They will be impressed. I can tell you, they will be impressed. I get questions all the time. What's really impresses me is when someone says, I took your answer, I did these little steps, and you know what, you made a flaw here. I think you did, did you really? And I make, I make mistakes all the time. And that feedback loop will help cement that you are part of the community. You're engaging, you're talking, and then obviously the end, rinse, repeat. Do it again, ask another question, do a little research, post the blog. If all it is is nothing more than you publicly sharing your own learning, that's fantastic. It forces you to write, and you need to be better at writing. There's a lot of people say, well, I love talking. Yeah, right, I know, write. People don't necessarily like hearing. They read, and by the way, reading is a, uh, Random access method, I can look down a page and scan down and see what I want. Listening is a sequential access method and it's way less efficient. And so if you want to engage in the community, do so. There's hundreds of people online right now listening to me speak. That means there's hundreds of people who could, within the next week or so, post a blog about a question that they had, that they did some research on, that you know what? If you have a question, I bet someone else has the same question, and they will like to hear what you wrote, and then you can engage with them. So the goal here is to be in the arena. You're here. You've made a first step. You're part of the Wi-Fi Design Day community. There's a lot of more things you can do. So engage with the community. How to engage? Give you a little list here. That's my presentation for Wi-Fi Design Day 2021. If we have time and you have questions, I'm available. Sam? Thanks very much, Keith. Um, certainly eight on, online lessons there to live your lives by, um, I think. Uh, I've got a couple of questions about the, uh, the MCS tool that you showed. Um, where can people get a, a copy of that? Is that available on the WLAN Pro's website? Uh, yes, it is on the WLAN Pro's website. It's also available uh, they can cut it right out of this page. <laughs> There's a PDF version you can get on that website. Um, and uh, I just sent you and you can share with them all these slides and they can have it as well. Okay. There's also see. this one that they can look at as well and, and use. If on my website, if you go to wmpros.com slash troubleshooting, there's uh, all of these and more little tips and tips and tricks and things you can use. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, when we share slides next week, then um, you'll have a, a copy of those. Or, as Keith said, you can go to the WLANS Pros website if you are eager to get your hands on it straight after the uh, the sessions today. Um, not really a question, but somebody just saying that they've particularly enjoyed your presentation. They're currently preparing for CWNA, so it's been a real help for them, um, which is what these sessions are all about. I, I think it's fantastic. Uh, a, a tip, having having taught CBMA for nearly 20 years, um, study, <laughs> uh, read. The book's like this thick. It's, it's, it's a monster book, but there's a lot of information. Uh, I personally like uh, the Westcott and Coleman book. It's published by Cybex. It's, I think, a better, uh, here, I'll use a, a fancy word, a better tome, because it's a big fat book, of um, a reference guide. I think it's better at learning how the concepts work. If you want to help pass the exam, the CWMP version of the CWNA study guide might be a better, shorter, more concise uh, book for you to work through. So uh, personally, I like them both. 
and if, if, if all you're out after is, I want to pass the test, I don't really, really want to learn, I just want to pass the test, the CBMP book's probably better for that. I think the CW, the Cybex version is a better reference guide and you'll learn more things uh, over a longer period of time. They just came out with a new edition, but I can tell you, if you went back to a 20-year-old CWNA guide, uh, by the way, that one's free. It was published by the precursor to the CWMP company. It was called Planet3 Wireless. They they published their own, they owned the copyright. And so you can get that on online. It's just a PDF now. I'm betting that book still carries at least 80% of what you need to pass the test. The core principles of how Wi-Fi work haven't changed in, in 20 years. Good top tip. Thanks, Keith. Um, a pleasure as always, and uh, we hope to see you back in the UK next year. Plan on being there. <laughs>